Okay. Um, so I welcome all of you uh, to this edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. And uh, for those who are joining uh, from YouTube and of course the Zoom audience internally, I welcome all of you on this slightly rainy Wednesday uh, at Mumbai. And um, we have a pleasure that we are joined by Dr. Neil Sarovar Bhavesh, who uh, is joining us from ICGEB and sitting uh, probably in his office in the, at, at New Delhi, um, who is actually going to give a special colloquium on Professor Richard Ernst, who recently passed away uh, amidst us. Um, before I uh, formally invite uh, Dr. Bhavesh for this uh, colloquium, I just wanted to give a brief, back, brief background of the Wednesday colloquium. Uh, to those who are joining for the first time. Uh, the Wednesday Colloquium actually is one of the oldest scientific forum uh, at TIFR, and it was started by our founding director, Professor Homi Bhava. The idea behind uh, the Wednesday Colloquium was to bring all the scientists within the TIFR community um, at least under one you know, room for uh, at least one hour a week, that is Wednesday, 4 p.m., so that they can hear together leading experts from different fields of science, phys physics, chemistry, and biology, uh, discuss their work in the broader context of the overall scientific um, sort of uh, accomplishments. Um, and that allowed for sort of appreciation of the, those individual fields, um, remarkable achievements in a broader paradigm, in a broader context. Uh, the idea also was to bring about collaborative efforts within the scientists in TIFR, and that really actually uh, kept this particular colloquium series going for all these years. Many of uh, the colloquium coordinators are here who, um, uh, who have conducted this uh, series, and I'm thankful that I get this opportunity uh, in the last two years. So, um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Neil Sarovar Bhavesh, who actually is um, uh, senior is a group leader actually yeah, at ICGEB. Uh, he has been uh, um, expert in NMR uh, structure determination. He did his PhD with Professor Hosur um, right here in TIFR Mumbai, and has been uh, you know has been uh, one of the leading experts in the country and internationally in solving large crystal uh, large uh, NMR structures. But apart from NMR, um, actually Neil has now made inroads in X-ray crystallography as well. And he has been doing both NMR and crystallography simultaneously in some of these systems that he looks at, very complex, large uh, protein as well as nucleic acid systems. Um, uh, his background, uh, of course, um, after his PhD uh, with Professor Hosur, um, which he finished in 2003, he moved to Eteha Zurich, where he worked with Nobel laureate Kurt Butrick uh, as a postdoctoral scientist uh, for almost four years before returning back to ICGEB and uh, became an independent scientist there. Um, uh, for his work, uh, Neil has uh, been sort of uh, recognized, and uh, he he was the young he won the Young Scientist Award from National Academy of Science, uh, Sciences India. Then he went. Uh, went on to give uh, the Uma Khan Sinha Memorial Award lecture um, in the Indian Science Congress, uh, um, yeah, which was held in 2012. Uh, and then recently, he actually delivered the Professor S. Subramaniam uh, Lecture Award um, in the National Magnetic Resonance Society, NMRS conference in India in 2017. Um, Neil uh, has a, a, a very strong background in sort of, uh, of course, multidimensional NMR, uh, but he is has also written uh, recently an article uh, for Physics Today um, uh, covering the life and work of Professor Richard Ernst. And that is where I think he will uh, bring this colloquium in context through, uh, through that article. And uh, I hope all of you can enjoy the really unbelievable contributions of Professor Richard Ernst. Neil? Thank you. Thank you, Jodhisman, for giving me an opportunity to be here. It's a uh... It's a huge opportunity. It's a privilege to be talking in TFR Colloquium, which has a rich history 
and a tradition. And I remember joining as a graduate student in DCS, and Professor Samresh Mitra was the chairman, and and he explained the sanctity of the colloquium and asked us all, all of us to attend every colloquium. And same thing, Professor Hasur also told me during my PhD program. And it became a part of life. It's okay, four o'clock, you have to be there in AG 66. So this was kind of an, an discussion after the colloquium. So thank you, Jyotisman, for giving me this opportunity. And it is again an honor to talk about an eminent scientist, Professor Richard Ernst, who has made not only contribution in science, which resulted also not Nobel Prize only to him, but led the foundation for Nobel Prizes for three more scientists. So that kind of influence he had in this field. And I just wanted to mention, sorry, Neil, I was interrupting you. I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Vandana Nalal, who actually uh, Nanal, who actually uh, suggested your name. And so uh, she is amongst in the audience. So thank you, Vandana. No, yes, I mean, that's what you, which you wrote, said, the physics today thing means it was an opportunity given by Vandana and Arnav actually I means so which I I recollected everything and then I formulated a story and so thanks to them also and for this also Vandana thank you so professor uh, coming back to professor Ernst I means uh, his influence not only in science but also in the art and how the art and science can bring come together and bring a rich knowledge together and then Another part, how the science and art can combine to society as such and spirituality as such and dissemination of this knowledge for the welfare of the way. So in that way, the personality of Professor Richard Ernst was multidimensional. Of course, he developed multidimensional enema, but he himself was a multidimensional. That's why I thought it is appropriate to keep this title as multidimensional Professor Richard Ernst. <clears throat> He was a regular visitor to the conferences, meeting, talks in India. And I first met him in TIFR in 1999 when he visited for a NMR meeting. And this is a, one of the slides which in one of the NMR meeting which he presented. And he was talking about how the tree of knowledge of science grows. So he was explaining the things evolved with the fundamental principles of physics. And then slowly it finds application in chemistry biology, medicine, and of course he said agriculture as well. So this is a slide that's where the knowledge evolves and finds application. And in this context, NMR has been one of the main tools. So this slide is actually his slide, which I borrowed from him after the talk. And NMR is just one kind of ladder which actually links everything. It has evolved from the physics and went up to the applications in biology and medicine, which everybody, and it's really, being used by everybody today, in especially in the medicine. And in that lecture, somebody asked him, of course, you are talking about physics, chemistry, biology, and medicine. So where is the, where is the mathematics? And then he had this slide next to that, where he showed mathematics is actually at the root of everything. And so the chemistry ladder goes up from the mathematics till the medicine. And in the following slides, we'll see how the NMR actually evolved and how he has contributed for taking the NMR from the physics to chemistry to biology and medicine. So and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, as we call it, was developed or born in 1946 by the contribution of Bloch and Purcell who were developing on the fundamental principle of nuclear magnetism developed by Rabi, Pauli, Stern and every others. And they used the permanent magnets and to see if the nuclear spins can be excited and if they finally could excite with the radio frequency and observe the signal. The principles of NMR are very simple. It means you have the little magnet, this little nuclear magnets swimming inside the solution or in the thing. In absence of magnetic field, they are distributed everywhere. When there is an external magnetic field is applied, they align to the direction of magnetic field and then you have a net magnetization. And Due to this hyperfine interaction, we observe, let's say for the spin half nuclei, there are different two demon levels, and one is anti parallel and parallel. And you, the energy difference between both these levels are, are actually directly proportional to the magnetic field and directly proportional to the gyromagnetic ratio of the nucleus. 
So, and the distribution among this energy levels is governed by same Boltzmann law. So, if you look at this thing, the difference for the one Tesla, the population difference is one in million. This is one in million, and that's why this becomes an insensitive spectroscopy. All and that's was what people were trying. Porcelain block tried when they measure the signal using either the sweeping magnetic field or the sweeping frequency traditionally, which is like for any absorption spectroscopy. And the first signal of water was so insensitive that for a such a highly concentration protons solvent, you have this kind of signal. And as you see from this data, means this table, the NMR spectroscopy lies at the bottom of the sensitivity table. So it is one of the most insensitive spectroscopy because the energy gap, as I explained before, is very less. And you require radio frequency to use it. And that's why it's very insensitive spectroscopy. In, in between also, Professor Dharmati, Srinivas Dharmati, was also working in the block lab. And he found there are three signals in ethanol. And so that was a kind of beginning that earlier physicists have thought that all the protons in any compound should give one signal. So there was something different in this. So different protons like OH group or the CH2 group and the methyl group give three different signals. So it seems there's something is going on different. And that's what has been summarized by Ray Freeman in 1995 that it was realized there was a small but significant shielding effect by the extra nuclear electrons, the chemical cyprus bond. This chemical cyprus, the difference in different absorption frequency of different nuclei. This may have remained a mere regrettable complication for the physicist. Had not a chemist, guess this Dharmati, pointed out that if the chemical shifts were indeed real, then the proton spectrum of it also should have three different separate resonances. And that was the beginning. From the starting point, the physicists found it to be less useful, and the chemist thinking it become will become more and more useful. That because it is providing an information on the chemical nature of the compound. Incidentally, it will be good to mention that Dharmati returned to India and started the NMR Research Center in 1953 at TFR with 30 megahertz spectrometer, and that's where the NMR Research Group started in TFR. Coming back to the insensitive spectroscopy, here this is the first signal of water which observed by block and person for a, for a 56 molar compound and such a poor signal to noise ratio. In order to increase the sensitivity or get a better signal to noise, one has to repeatedly scan it so that you get a better. But if you have to increase the signal to noise ratio by double, then the number of scans would go four times. And this would have taken exponential number of time because if for one scan, if you are complete either sweeping the magnetic field or sweeping the radio frequency, it is taking hundreds of seconds for 10 scan, it will be something like, or four scan, it will be 4,000 seconds. So it was becoming more of a tedious job. And for this reason, it was not able to find any practical application in any field, even though it was found to be, and that's where people started calling NMR as more like a no more research. So the bottleneck here was, of course, it can provide some information, but it is a very insensitive spectroscopy. So if for a solvent, if this kind of signal, it cannot be used. And in this context, here enters the Richard Ernst, who after master's degree from Eteha and for PhD in chemistry from Eteha, he moved to California to work in a very INC for 1960, and where he started working on this systems how to enhance the sensitivity of NMR spectroscopy. So he was trying different things. So what he found that all this magnetic field, which are aligned to the B0 field, if some, if one can apply, instead of scanning through the radio frequency, if you can apply a short duration radio frequency pulse with high power, the, all the magnetism can be flipped to the transverse plane. And in the transverse plane, one can receive the signals. And similarly, a 180 degree pulse can completely reverse the population from the form, it can completely invert it to 180 degree. And that way, the, the, the scanning process was the, we tried to replace with the pulse and pulse radio frequency with high power, short duration pulses. This FID which was obtained was the intensity as a function of time. So this had information 
the collect the receiver collect is collecting data as an intensity as a function of time so then he used a, almost a three century older than him the things developed by joseph fourier a fourier transformation when you can change one function to another function and he applied that and use it to this change the time domain data to the frequency domain data and that led to the birth of fourier transformation nmr spectroscopy and which he published in this review of scientific instrument and he got the patent for that particular discovery and this completely changed the field now you could do the 100 second experiment in few millisecond so then if you want to scan now 100 times it was easy so if you what time was spent for taking one scan you can do in same time means 100 scan so a tenfold increase in sensitivity was achievable and that actually the discovery of Richard Ernst added wings to the NMR so it could fly it could have application in many things where even the low concentration of compound could be measured. Neil, yes. Neil uh, yeah. this is Jyotish Pan. Huh, I just yeah. want to ask a quick question. Yeah. So this idea of doing the detection in the time domain, mm -hmm. where does the origin of that lie? I mean, in the sense, in the magnetic spectroscopy, that was pretty, uh, was that established before that or uh, uh, where, where was this idea of doing the time domain detection came from? Because in most of the uh, most of the spectroscopies during that time, hmm. optical spectroscopy, for example, yeah. there were of course the lasers had just been born mm -hmm. uh, in sixty. So and people had started doing some mode locking and all that stuff. They had just you know started to learn doing those. But in the magnetic uh, spectroscopy, where was this like? Can, could you give us a context as to how did he come to this idea that uh, we should do this in time domain and then Fourier transform it and not do directly in the frequency domain? Means, uh, once I remember, means he explaining this thing that first he saw there was an eco experiment done. Eco okay. experiment was that Han had published yes. in 1951 that right. you have a, you flip it and you can get back the magnetization. Right. It was again same come after that you apply and then you can come back. So right. there is that. and there are other oscillations were also observed before that. Okay. In the frequency, but this was a pure innovative idea of that's what people say. This is a pure innovative idea of Richard Ernst to collect the time domain data. Right. So Han Echo was already done in 52, 53, right? So that's 1951. Right. Han Echo, yeah. Han Echo yeah. had okay. published with the traditional CWNMR the Echo. Right. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks. So sir. that's why. That's why this, this is con considered to a very fundamental thing of Richard Ernst to actually measure a time domain data. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. And for that, actually, for this kind of thing, he actually got the patent also. And that's that's what it's here. Yeah. First of all, the impulse resonance spectrometer, including a time averaging computer and Fourier analyzer. So that was his fundamental idea. And that. So with using Fourier pair, the FID and spectra formed a Fourier pairs. So you can transform the FID and get a spectrum. So in a nutshell for a observation, you after a pulse, you collect the decay, which is the free induction decay, where the intensity is intensity as a function of time is collected. And once it is Fourier transformed, it is coming as an intensity as a function of frequency, function of frequency. Intensity is a function of frequency. Intensity is a function of frequency. I think I, I am think getting equal. I... Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Somebody has used. I am getting echo. Yeah, I don't know what that X is. Uh, somebody has logged in as X, and that was coming up. I don't know. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, and another aspect of NMR is that you the intensity is direct proportional to number of the atoms or protons in that case is there. So it is directly proportional. So this is a fundamental discovery of Richard Ernst, which says revolutionize the field. You collect a time domain data, immediately do the computer transformation, free transformation and get it. But at that time, neither the computers were that capable of doing that thing, nor those kind of spectrometers were there. So things slowly evolved, started evolving in the, with the computers and things. So let me explain how the Fourier transformation in this case has actually enhanced the speed. And this is from the handbook written by Ray Freeman again. So he explained through a piano. So in piano, if somebody wants to measure 
the intensity and frequency of each key. The traditional approach, which is similar to what is CW, is to press each key and measure the intensity and frequency of each of the key. And if there are hundred, and if there are hundred keys, and one key will take one second time, then it will take hundred second of time. So what is Fourier transform approach is they take a long bar and press all the keys together and measure the intensity decaying as a function of time and simply Fourier transform you get an intensity and full intensity and frequency information of all the key and this is the what is happy marriage between the people's in research in mathematics one in the basic basic science physics and chemistry separated by a three century brought to it broad thing so that also allowed the eco to be also done very easily which was done as i said by han so you apply a 90 degree pulse allow it to evolve that 180 degree pulse you again flip it everything here it continued to rotate in direction and it get focused so the pulse nmr also allowed the eco experiments to be done which could many other experiments could be done because you can again get back the magnetization at the same place next comes the development of the two dimensional nmr so if you so in many other compounds in as we know that different atoms are actually coupled to each other by a scalar coupling what we call it j coupling so they are means kind of which is explained by quantum mechanics that it is a tunnel through that and that's why electron cloud all this comes in and they're coupled so they were thinking okay whether we can get any information on how these atoms are coupled to each other and at that juncture Ernst published a, a two pulse experiment in this two pulse experiment what it actually let me use the pointer so what he did is a 90 degree pulse and then there is an incremented time delay here then again he used the 90 degree pulse after that there's t2 so this t1 time is incremented here so there are two time dimension and now here so now to whatever intensity we are collecting is of course as a function of t1 and t2 so there are two time dimension here and if a Fourier transform T1 will become omega 1, it's the first frequency, and T2 will become second frequency. So now intensity, which is collected as a function of two times after Fourier transformation, becomes intensity as a function of two frequencies. So in, if you look at this thing, so what is done is the T1 time is incremented. So here in T1 is incremented by delta T. So there is a one incremental taking place on this direction, and other time is in this direction. And this is what is uh, data finally collected in the computer or this thing so there are two time so for every t every t t1 there is a one t2 for every t1 there is a one t2 and once you fourier transform you get on this type of data where it, this is the intensity z is the intensity axis and on the side both the frequency axis so if you cut any any at any player above the noise level you get this kind of two dimensional spectrum and this is again in simplified way this thing how the the distance between two 90 degree pulse is being incremented and this he published in 1976 of course means he later what he found out and that is where his greatness comes into the picture he found that that Giner was presenting he has presented an idea of a pulse pair technique in 1971 at a ampere international summer school in Yugoslavia. And the only documentation of this presentation was the lecture note of Thomas Bauman. And then he went on to say, he said, okay, this first, this idea of two dimensional spectroscopy has come from Giner. And till the end, he always said that the first person to give postulate that 2D can be done was Giner. And of course, it this remained unpublished till that. And how did? So what does this 2D does? It allows a correlation between different atoms. In this case, through bonded. So if you look at this, A and B are two atoms. Neil, sorry, atom. sorry, yeah. again disturbing you. Go yeah. back for a second in the slide, Giner slide. Yeah. So was he still attending that conference, the school, or he was not part of that school? Hans was not part of that school at that time. So okay. he found out from the Thomas Bauman lecture notes. Okay, okay. But, and but, he, Mm -hmm. He went on to acknowledge this thing that he that was the first thing. Of course, Gina never published that thing, and that's where he is is a great human being, and then the, an honesty in science comes into the picture. Right, right, right. No, no. I think that that is how he laid I think path for other people to follow the same. Yes, and 
and means i'll just say means it's another example of that which is happening and happened in india also similar thing means people will know the arvind dr arvind kumar he went on and when he was giving a talk he went on to say no it was dr subhas mukhopadhyay who did the first in ivf baby so this kind of integrity remains with people right? these are the found foundations of the science actually right right thank you neil so so a and b are two atoms if they are connected by two bond you will see a cross peak here and this cross peak signifies that this is connected so the 2d spectroscopy allowed the chemist to go into the domain where they can see which atom is connected with bonds to so which one so and it was the starting point for application in chemistry because the sensitivity has increased the dimension correlations have come up and so that's what so in a better example here if you see this this pro, this hydrogen atom is connected to this hydrogen atom which we call alpha then you see a cross peak here if h alpha is then again connected by three bond to this hydrogen atom you see a cross peak and similarly the cross peak patterns comes up and that way one can look at how these different protons are organized in this particular compound after that ernst developed a collaboration with professor botrick and since both were at the same institute and in the almost same building and that's what he refers in the slide that it is botrick laboratory as botrick's home and richard earls laboratory at richard earls home and both collaborated with each other to get the functional insight in more into chemistry application and there their interest professor anil kumar anil kumar had done her his post doctoral work with uh, richard ernst and he went on to do a sabbatical with utrik and they discussing with ernst and utrik he developed a three pulse experiment in this case a very interesting thing he ernst had postulated that you apply a, a pulse like cozy up to here allow the time incrementation to take place and fix a constant time here where the, everything is in z direction the magnetization in z direction constant time we call a mixing time and then again apply a 90 degree pulse and collect the data in t2 domain so in this domain what is happening that all the protons are able to interact because they are in z direction to a dipole dipolar coupling so it means you are able to draw a space correlation between two different atoms and then he, this this was the first noji spectrum which were published by anil kumar and where you see anil richard ernst and kurt putrik as author in nbbrc and it became the foundation of founding the correlation through the space and it's a very interesting story which anil had published in a recent memorial in a magnetic resonance chemistry he writes by this time it was november of 1979 and both Ernst, professor ernst and wutrick were getting worried about me my wasting a whole year on a failed experiment i then pleaded with them to give me a, the 360 megahertz spectrometer and remember that's the only one spectrometer in the laboratory for 10 days he asking for 10 days during the christmas break and it was difficult to get tell me i must tell you that it's difficult to get spectrometer for two or three days that time also i made it bit dramatic by saying that i am not a christian and that i was not going anywhere during that christmas break which was normal for everybody in europe this was immediately corrected however i needed another intervention from almighty one night perhaps the christmas night experiment suddenly worked under detailed investigation i found that that night i had forgotten to change the filter function of nagayama another post doctor fellow working with putri which was still lying on a particular disk so that time they used to use punch cards so i immediately learned that we needed a sine bell filter function otherwise the dis dispersive tail of large peak of residual water dominated all the small noe cross peaks in this cross peaks of the protein protons so in that case he applied a very harsh function a sine bell function to kill the largest water signal so that these are suppressed and then to see the water signal and that's what is seen so koji and noji the coalition spectroscopy which allows a true bond correlation between the hydrogen atom and noji which allows the true space correlation between the two bond became very very useful and the birth of this spectroscopy the 2d spectroscopy one with the true bond correlation which we call coalition spectroscopy and the total correlation spectroscopy and 
the true space correlation, which we call nuclear or Hauser enhanced spectroscopy, became very, very useful to chemist to get any information on the compound, get the structure, even get the conformation of small ligands very easily through NMR spectroscopy in solution. So for all these effort, the development of Fourier transformation NMR spectroscopy and development of two-dimensional spectroscopy, Professor Ernst was awarded Nobel Prize in chemistry. And the country, his contribution was so immense and so important that he was the sole awardee that year for the chemistry. And the citation read, for his contribution to the development of the metrology of high resolution nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So in recent time, it's really difficult to find anyone getting a sole Nobel Prize and he was one of the few ones. And Nobel Prize also the news come, can come at any place. And in that case, Richard Ernst received the Nobel Prize news through the pilot at 30,000 feet when he was flying from Europe to States. And so he had the privilege or the or the air hostess had the privilege of taking the photograph with the Nobel laureate, first, first, first photo with the Nobel Prize winner <coughs> Ernst at 30,000 feet. So what his contribution actually done, it had added rings to the NMR and to the dimension to the NMR and NMR which used to be called NMR is hardly useful, change to NMR is very useful. So. And all this development actually brought because now NMR is finding applications, started finding application in chemistry and other places. So people started investing also, industry started investing in, into that. And that led to the use of superconducting magnets, new materials came up and which I was discussing with Professor Matthew before this uh, Dean, the new magnets have come up, the superconducting new electronics have come up and the NMR spectrometers changed completely. And that is what is there the science actually drives the demand and demand actually drives the investment so Ernst was actually able to start a completely new industry in that sense that new spectrometers new magnet company returns coming started coming up and that of course increased the resolution of the NMR spectrometer and sensitivity so it became more useful and more and more start develop more and more development started coming up to time and soon NMR enters the space of structure biology until then uh, X-ray crystallography, which was discovered long back, were used to pack the molecules and then pack it completely in organized crystals and then sign the X-ray on it and get to how it looks like. But NMR made it possible that you can look at the same molecules as if they are swimming in the solution. And that's what made it very attractive to that get without getting the crystal because crystallization is still is a tough thing even today. So even without getting a crystals, one can look at the structures in solution using NMR spectroscopy. And this happened because development of the NOSI in, by, in the lab of Professor Ernst and Professor Butrick, where they could get a space correlation. For the structure, one needs a space correlation. So how one get the structures using NMR spectroscopy using NOSI? So let's suppose if we have different atoms here arranged by that, and each atom is producing this kind of resonance frequency at their distinct absorption frequency, that they absorb because of the electronic environment, they are different chemical shifts. And then you connect which atom is enclosed in a space through noisy spectra. So these are noisy and spectra. So you connect which atom is close to which atom. And finally, once you know all which atom is close to which one, and this spec closeness is seen up to six, six angstrom distance in noisy spectra. So then you know about a distance in different atoms. And once you may know about the distance in different hydrogen atoms, you can make a model how this things are looking in three-dimensional space. And this is the principle of determining the three-dimensional structures using the NOGI spectrum from in NMR. And similarly, that is what is seen here, here in the protein. Also, you know the interproton distance. And once you know the interproton distance, you can construct the protein structure in a three-dimensional space. <coughs> and this was published, first protein structure was published in 1982 and from the group of Kurt Wuttrich. And that time, Professor Hasur was also there. So he oversaw the first building block of the molecule. And for this, Wuttrich received the Chemistry Nobel Prize in 2002. And that he shared with the two guys, others who developed the mass spectrometry. So now we see how the NMR, the contribution of Ernst actually changed the NMR, starting from the physics part 
it went very useful in a chemistry and it found huge application in NMR spectroscopy and that resulting in another Nobel Prize. So that came the other part development that one can use other nuclei. If you can change the nuclei with other NMR active, in this case I am showing with the N N15, then so one can obtain the N15 spectrum also, same two dimensional spectrum. <clears throat> so on one end, so if so on one axis, the frequency absorption frequency of nitrogen is there. On the other axis, the absorption frequency of proton is there. So a typical N15 HSQC looks like that. So you have the you have the nitrogen here and you have the proton and the intensity is look like. So in T1 dimension, T1 dim time dimension nitrogen is measured and in T2 dimension direct dimension proton is measured. And if you cut this cube from a slice out from this, and this is what you get HSQC spectrum. And HSQC spectrum is one of the most fundamental thing people do in protein NMR spectroscopy, where each peak actually denotes one amino acid of a protein. So and it, it continued evolving and more and more nucleus were used. So in this case, a triple resonance three-dimensional spectroscopy developed where one axis is one frequency axis is a carbon 13, other is nitrogen, and the direct dimension is the proton axis. This also led the pulse, as I explained, the pulse allowed an eco and the magnetism time transfer also possible. So the magnetization could be transformed from proton to nitrogen. Nitrogen, again, you label here with the frequency, come to nitrogen, okay, thanks then take a T3. So that way, the three dimensional experiment could be done easily. You have a three time incrementation, and three time incrementation gives to three frequency information. And this led to this kind of a very nice triple resonance 3D spectrum where you see nice absorption peak and the volume is signifying the intensity and all the three axes signifying the three nucleus absorption frequency. And NMR after that also continued taking the principles from the UNS, the FT NMR in 2D and in now it has developed from 2D to 3D where you have that I've seen shown before, the four dimensional where you can have the fourth axis also in that so you have a two proton axis, one nitrogen and one carbon axis, and for further five dimensional, six dimensional, seven dimensional. So what in any model dimension actually means, how many sub -frequen absorption frequency one can simultaneously obtain in a single spectrum. So this is what is the meaning of dimension in NMR when we talk about NMR. It's not the physicists who talk real dimension, it's a completely different dimension which we speak in NMR. And this, the, the, all this spectroscopy developed by him led to some very unique thing, not only the structures in vitro, which were also done by crystallography, some new things have come up. So even today, NMR is the only method where the protein structures can be determined in living cell. And this is one of the work which was published in the last decade, 2009, where they looked so that the structures of a protein inside a living cell is same what was determined outside the cell. Of course, people were new, people knew this is like that, but there were some people thinking oh, it might be different. But this, the NMR structure in living cell was the final nail in the coffin of those arguments, actually. Second important thing has come up from the NMR, it's again few years back in 2016. The disorder, people were talking, they are disordered protein. About a third of protein are disordered in the human cells. Then there were questions whether you are the preparations are wrong, that you prepare wrongly so that you get disorder protein. But NMR finally showed it that even a mammalian cell, alpha synuclein, is structurally, sorry, is structurally disordered in a monomeric form. And this, no other technique even today can show. It's only NMR, multidimensional. Then it was a huge development in solid state NMR. It allowed exploration, structural exploration of the species, which could not be done by any other method. Even extracrystallography could not do very well. And this allowed some of the disease causing state of the protein which cause like a beta which cause alzheimer disease or alpha synuclein which in cause parkinson disease those could be solved by solid state nmr how they look like and what intervention can be done from that to give, to develop therapeutics and nmr solid state nmr is a strong group led by madhu and vipin and others at tfr and they are doing i think similar work on this line another important thing was the whether two unfolded protein remain unfolded or not. And this NMR also showed that in many cases, they independently they are unfolded 
but they when they come together they form a structure so this was a mutual synergistic folding and this was shown again in 2002 so why i gave these examples because nowadays it has become many people are talking that okay deep mind has come alpha fold has come so every structure is predicted now 95 percent of the proteome is dead so these are the challenges these are the challenges still remaining and these challenges can still be solved only by NMR spectroscopy using the principles which Professor Ernst laid down that you can get insight into the functional state of the protein inside the cell. Can I ask a question, Neil, quickly? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, of course, you can record all these nice uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, spectra from the proteins, but you have to label them. The first condition is you have to label, right? Mm -hmm. So that is one of the important criteria that you have to, the sample preparation also is critical, right, for that. And then the second thing is the concentrations that you need to think about. Now, apart from this challenge, um, according to the new ways of solving structures, uh, how do you sort of uh, solve, you, you, you have a, like a 50 kilodalton or a 60 kilodalton protein, with hundreds uh, of amino acids, right? Um, how do you actually look at all the correlation maps? These are, of course, data intensive. All the correlations you have to find, you have to see how much is the coupling. So are there algorithms that directly go in and uh, do this automatically for you? Or you have to really uh, do things in a, a manual way or a step a sequential manner? Okay. So very interesting, this is a very interesting observation and question as such. What actually these developments also have taken in the field of the development of different algorithms, automation, use of AI, and all these things have come into the picture. So once you have this data, and of course, the labeling is one of the prerequisites for many other things, many of the experiments, even in if you are doing inside the cell or not. That this the reason is very simple. You have to get your protein, your protein of interest separated from the noise, which is other protein. And for this purpose, the labeling is good. As for the concentration is the required, now even there are structures available at the 50 micromolar concentration. So concentration okay. is not a very big issue nowadays, but people are able to do it. And there are new developments which is coming up. It's the DNP NMR, where you can transfer the electron polarization to the, to the nucleus so that you can increase the sensitivity. So these are coming up. And that's why I'm telling you, now the challenge is completely different. You have the multidimensional spectroscopy and this still remain what, what Professor Ernst and Wutrich have done. So they remain same today. The only thing how you can increase the sensitivity much more, much more, much more. But of course, getting rid of the background is required labeling. And automation has become so good that even if you have a good protein, a stable protein, in two days, you can have a structure by NMI spectroscopy. And we have achieved even in four days. It means it is two days, people say, we have ourselves achieved in four days a good structure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that I want to know that, that time scale because, yeah. of course, as you pointed out, the deep mind and other kinds of uh, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, AI-based, uh, uh, you know, uh, Algorithms have come into the market with David Baker and other people who are pioneering that. Um, NMR, of course, stands as an experiment, right? Mm -hmm. NMR stands as an experiment. So they will all, so the experiment always wins over. But the point here is that um, still the economics of running an experiment versus running an algorithm will still be an important question. And if things that's absolutely out, right. But there are certain systems like unfolded protein systems. And Deep mind or can't do anything. Alpha fold can't do anything in that. So they means they you have to do anything on that unfolded protein. You have a structure. If you want to do a structure, you have to go to NMR. If you want to do other things with the kinetics, you have to go to fluorescence. So this will remain. Still, there are no algorithm or something which can do a structural propensity for the natively unfolded protein. And about one third of protein are a natively unfolded protein. And their X-ray also can't do anything. Cryogenium can't do anything. So NMR is the only technique, right. even today. Right. Okay. Even today. Yeah. Even Thank after you. development of all these AI and other techniques. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. So the other part. So now we have seen how NMR has evolved from the physics to chemistry to biology. The final frontier was medicine, 
and that has a direct implication in society. So what they did actually, they used the gradient. So in the gradient, what happens actually, so NMR sample, if you apply a linear gradient, let's say in a jet gradient, in this case, the example is given with the two tubes. So what happens if you have the same magnetic field for both the NMR tubes here, then you get only one signal because both have identical, so what, let's assume in water, both have identical so protons and same magnetic field. So they have the same absorption. But if you apply a gradient, this will see completely different magnetic field compared to that. So the, even in spite of having the same compound, this will give two resonance absorption here. <laughs> and this formed the, the gradient formed the basis of MRI imaging. So water signal, same thing in a normal field will give one signal, but once you apply a field gradient, the water molecules at each place will see completely different field and each will absorb a different. So this was this allowed the spatial resolution to be achieved through NMR spectroscopy. And, and also they developed the N MRI and the N MRI uh, nuclear word was dropped just for the patient purposes so they don't get of fear or get a fear that okay nu something nuclear is going on in that. So it was just said magnetic resonance imaging. And these are some of the beautiful pictures which could be obtained using the MRI through the special thing that we allow. In this case, the whole body angiography can be easily done by MRI. And now the AIMS, means Professor Jagannathan has been doing the, uh, quite often this whole body angiography with the MRI. So you don't have to really go any other technique for that. In this case, they found something very interesting MRI, which could not be achieved, obtained by any other thing. So this is a paper from Science so in, in, uh, in 2001, where they have used alcoholic and non-alcoholic brain images from a female and male. And they found that alcoholic female have much more shrinkage in a brain compared to the male. So I don't know, means so this will motivate or demotivate some of us, but, uh, but this is some interesting observation also has come from MRI. And for this development of MRI, Lottebar and Mansfield received Medicine Nobel Prize in 2003. So this is what is there. So they, they, they were the other two people after Butrik who worked on the principle laid down by Ernst and received a Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> and they have, so the final frontier was that, that medicine and this find now immense use in medicine. So routinely, and now we have seen mushrooming of MRI in, in our country also, that for everything you get an MRI. The best part is that even the empty spaces area the lungs can be imaged to MRI. Last was uh, fMRI, which developed, which allowed the, the NMR to move from medicine to the area of psychology or the cognitive behaviors. Another thing where you see the motor function of the brain, how they look like. So even for language activation, which part of the brain is getting activated for auditory act activation, for motor processor, for visual, and all these things could be imaged. And this was the functional MRI. And in this case, you can see a very good image. It was done in, in mass in Delhi. What is the effect of meditation on the brain? So for different age group, they have measured the MRI images and they got significant data how meditation helps. Can I ask another question here because of the historic So the uh -huh. MRI prize was also controversial. Raymond Damadian was yeah. ignored in that. So is there any anything that you want to say on that? Or? Yeah, Raymond Demadian public, in fact, he got offended because he had a patent, US patent for the MRI. Right. But the first principles were given by Paul Lottebar. And okay. incidentally, incidentally, Lottebar presented before the publication, the presented the principle of MRI at a conference in PFR Bombay. Oh, really? Yes, okay. in 1971. Fantastic. Okay. So, Lotte were presented this thing at TFR Bombay 1971. So, the first and the use of gradients were also developed by Mansfield. So, these were actually awarded, and there was a people answered also, many people answered also that machine Damadian developed and he got the patent for it. But the principle behind it, how to image it and use a gradient, and Lotte Lotte had discussed Mansfield it. had given. So, in that case, I think Nobel, in my opinion, means people can have different. In my opinion, Nobel Committee was right in giving these two guys the Nobel Prize. Okay, thank you, thank you. And FMRI, FMRI functional MRI, 
not only remained in medicine, it has found very good application in agriculture. So these are some of the images of the plant tissues, plant cells, fruits, which have been imaged. And you see such of fine details, which otherwise no other technique can provide in detail. So MRI is becoming quite useful in even agricultural system. So the development of 2D NMR and FTM NMR, NMR which added wings and dimensions to NMR has found NMR spectroscopy to be applied not only to the atomic resolution, structure of molecules, dynamics of molecules, drug discovery in the chemistry and medicinal chemistry. It has come used in the quality control. Now there are databases available for wine and milk industry is using biomarker discovery from the patient sample urine and blood, serum, saliva, all CBS, all kind of fluid imaging MRI has seen fMRI oil exploration people have developed using MR, NMR or zero fill NMR which will not go into detail right now but zero fill NMR can be used to detect oil inside the earth crust and now people are using for explosive detection so many times you must have seen if crossing through the airport there are mass spectrometer kept for the detection of explosive at certain airport in Russia people are trying to use NMR for the detection of explosive so this is an interesting application has come up recently. And this is one message which has pub was published in physics today, few years back, that magnetic resonance imaging is an irrefutable testimonial to the enormous value of basic research. So that's what we see NMR has become ubiquitous in academia and industry, everywhere industry, you have a biosimilar, biomimics, you have a drug industry everywhere or the wine industry, everywhere it find uses. So a basic research development of fundamental that you can collect time domain data. That was Earth's discovery led to a huge development and it finds enormous value. So basic research actually lays foundation for the all the applications. So how the NMR has evolved from such a large spectrum of 55 molar water and this lousy permanent magnet, it has come to a protein spectra, which is something like 50 micromolar and such a high field NMR, which is 1.2 gigahertz, highest field available today as of now. So this whole revolution, actually the credit of everything goes to Professor Ernst who laid this foundation for that. And that's why the, the break point for you find Professor Ernst's discovery here, the block and processor found a nuclear induction measurement, but the actual application with the 50 NMR found and that led to chemistry Nobel Prize to Woodrick and Bax also contributed to development of in protein NMR. And finally, the lot of and Mansfield received Nobel Prize in medicine. And this is, this is the MRI image, which you see on the right side is the MRI image of Professor Ernst himself. So one can look how, how the quality of his brain. It was so good for this all purpose. The other part, which I would like to dwell upon in the later part of his life, he started looking at some of the characteristic of the paintings and he had a special love for the paintings in 90, late 1960s he started collecting this tibetan this tanka, tanka paintings from nepal and that time it was really sold very quite cheap and he collected he started collecting and those paintings were made 15th 16th century 18th century 17th century and he developed a connect with dalai lama and he invited dalai lama to Iteha also where Swiss president hosted him. So what he did actually with his Nobel Prize, he moved into other domain. He started working with a Raman spectroscopy. And I think Jyotisman will be very happy to see this. Probably he can also connect with some of the artists in Bombay, which has. So the Raman spectrometer, he mounted on the rail. And this is a microscope here. So what he found that Raman spectroscopy can be used to non-destructively analyze the paintings, find out the paint or find out the what pigments were used for the coloring those things. And that's what he has developed in the end. He all the tools here, he made everything. He bought the Raman spectrometer here, put it on the rail. Everything was designed by him at his at the basement at his home. And he said he doesn't want to really alter the setting in the house. So he used the basement so that his wife doesn't get disturbed. And so he explained me when, when I visited him and then he explained me there how the working of this thing. So
So yeah, input in, input increase input. the sound. Increase the sound. What's the spectrum of the back here? This is a broker spectrum of the. Mm. Yeah. So this is this was a short movie. Oh, okay. So what and the key information like for he gave an example that is published also in this article. So in this painting, there are different pigments were used. So you see the and there he applied he used the Raman spectrum for that getting different stretches and different information because at Raman in Raman spectroscopy at low laser power this is non destructive so painting value is not lost. So he found out okay the red is used cinnabar and mercury sulfide orange is from the red lead this is lead oxide. And blue is from this azurite, green is mixture of malachite, malachite, and all these things he could find that out. So that was his another space, another area where he brought close the art and science, how can then be used for that. And later he also wrote about a documentary which was made in a movie, The Science First Dharma, Social Responsibility. This is a Carlo Burton film, which is talks about the science, the dharma. And the social responsibility of that. And this is again one of the slides from his sleeves. So he says the societal and global level of scientists can have their width, while the basic research level can provide it a depth. So both width and depth is required for a science to connect to the society. He also took interest in many things in India. And he always visited some of the poor regions in country, apart from visiting. ISC Bangalore and TIFR, where he nurtured NMR groups. He always had discussion with many informal discussion with the student. And I was fortunate to have one in 1999 also. And then since then, I was in touch with him. So this is one of the places in remote places in the Bhuneshwar part where he laid the foundation. He contributed a lot and laid the foundation of a biotechnology school and an incubator there. And that incubator actually became now the country's number one incubator as ranked by Department of Biotechnology. And he kept taking interest. He visited a couple of times also again after that, and he kept in touch with that. He also contributed to the children education in one of the largest tribal education center in the Bhuneshwar. This is social, uh, social sciences where they take provide free education to the children, the tribals. And there he took part. This is one picture where he attended at Atari border after the NMR conference. And I was also fortunate to be in touch with him for since 2000, met many a times. So this was in Lindau, this was again in Zurich when we attended some of the lectures. And it is again at Bhuneshwar. This was at IIC Bangalore. So the top, left. top, top left picture, the top left picture, where is that? This is Lindau. Okay. Lindau. So when I was in TFR 2002, I went to Lindau this meeting. That right, right, right. And one of the prize collection, which I have when I visited his home was a autograph book. The one of the best book in NMR, the principle of one and two dimension NMR spectroscopy, which he gifted me after signing and it, it's one of the prize collection which I have. And so it is actually his loss is an immense to the science, to the other field art and everything because he has a collection. But at the same time, we need to celebrate his life because the contribution he made are immense. It means it's, it's really too much for anybody to do. And he was such a best part but he was must a very good human being and humble person. With that, I thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Neil. I would like all of you to please uh, unmute yourself and just uh, do a round of applause for uh, Dr. Bhavesh. So for going through this. Um, very nice perfect. talk. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thank so you. I, I open, open, uh, this talk for more discussions and comments from uh, my colleagues. Uh, yeah. Yes, Shudipto. Yes, Shudipto. Very good, Neil. Neil. Ah, sorry. Uh, Hosur has something to say. Hosur, go ahead. I said, no, very good. Very good collection. Very good presentation of all the material. Thank you, sir. All the slides which you had. Wonderful collection. 
Thank In you. fact, I would like to get some of them from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Neil, very nice. It was uh, mesmerizing because we have seen him occasionally uh, in India. And uh, you know, the last time I think he was here, he was talking about the Nepalese paintings. And I remember that. And uh, there's always thinking deep about anything, whether it's art or science, and the humble nature that strikes you. Uh, okay, but uh, let's get back to the science of it. And something that you were discussing during our one to one meeting, perhaps. It's good to uh, hear your comments in public. Uh, where is NMR headed now? And uh, given that it's for the large molecules is getting pushed by cryo TEM, which has become the de facto choice for uh, solving uh, structures of biomolecules, large biomolecules, large proteins. And um, in between, of course, X-ray has evolved in the sense that it's become much more regular thing to do, of course, still need to get the X-ray crystal structure done, etc. And now the new kid on the block is uh, Alpha Fold, which has claimed to have solved 98% of the human proteome, the structure, give a sequence and the structure comes. And um, given their recent success in uh, comparing with structures which are not published and their ability to predict it, it is possible they are quite right. They may not be, would not be 100% right, that's quite right. So where do you see NMR go from here? Arnst NMR, which is a revolution going uh, through Arnst, now where? Uh, it's a very interesting thing and it's very the right time we are discussing this thing because uh, what has happened means first thing one has to think how the alpha fold and deep mind has come up. Actually, the structure solved by NMR and X-ray laid the foundation for the formation of this alpha fold and deep mind. So for the rigid globular protein, they got the algorithm right because the large database in the protein data bank is available, which guided the machine learning and AI to come to this stage. Second comes where we stand. Of course, we have now we have all the tools technique available. cryo we have. X-ray crystallography is also state of the art. NMR is also a state of the art. But... The question remains which system to use for which technique. The last population of protein which are intrinsically unfolded protein. I mean, these are amenable to only NMR spectroscopy. We need NMR spectroscopy for that. If you want to fast screen any drug and optimize any site uh, functional group based on the based on the interaction, still NMR is very good. If you want to use anything amorphous solid for getting like a beta kind of thing, alpha synuclein aggregated protein, very you can get roughly idea from SACS, but it, the, if you want to get atomic resolution picture, one needs to solid state NMR. So it now remains the scientist's job to see what system he is working and where what technique one can use if it is to be applied. If something are working on globular protein, let's use the alpha alpha fold and get up that structure and try to see if this is working and with a drug binding and do the sorting kind of screening with any tool and see inhibitor can be developed or not. So this, so now it comes a much more at, at one, one point, it becomes too easy for the scientist to do many things. And other side, it is challenging for him or her to find what has to be done. So depending on what system you are working on. So problem has to be developed accordingly and technique to be chosen accordingly. One cannot claim, okay, I am, an, I am a pure NMR spectroscopy, I am a pure crystallographer, and I will just stick to this field. I think that era is gone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. Um, I also, okay, so Vivek has, Vivek has uh, raised his, yeah, Vivek, please yes. ask a question. Hi, hi Neil. Yeah, interesting hi, talk, Neil. So my question is uh, related to, uh, as a follow-up to Sudipto's question about, uh, use of solid chain NMR to really understand the protein folding and protein structure. So here, ideally, you need to you know freeze dry these proteins, right? So there is a possibility that during the sample preparation process, the protein may change their structure. So how do we really uh, you know solve this problem of uh, you know the sample preparation and change in the structure, and then get the uh, the solid chain NMR? No, the, see, Vivek, this is the problem associated with almost all technique, even in cryo EM, you have to freeze it and you layer it and then you loop it. Even in X-ray, you put it in a crystallography. So you get many times crystallographic artifacts. So the people do say that, okay, you are getting only one snapshot of a structure. <coughs> See this area. 
So here again, this comes, uh, means which I forgot to answer so big thing. Again, it comes like in many of the excess structure or thing, you get purely the cold state, which at the energetically bottom state, but the functional state are a little bit higher state. And those invisible states, which we call invisible states, the NMR spectroscopy is able to look those invisible states. And as for the sample is there, means this controversy was there before also. And that's why people showed as they showed from inside NMR that whatever structure determined outside is almost, almost identical what is inside the cell. So sample preparation, of course, it can, like in crystallography, what we see it, if you have a 10, let's say if you have a 10 conformation, a particular conformation can be just crystallized and equilibrium moves that side. So this phase drying can move our equilibrium to a particular side, but roughly you'll get the same structure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, questions, comments? Uh, I know Professor Hosur is here. Um, and uh, of course, other people who are related to NMR, Shudipta has already asked a question. I just wanted to, yeah, uh, Professor Hosur, uh, you, uh, you have any comments? Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, as, as of course, uh, Neil, Neil mentioned appropriately, NMR is here to stay for a, for a long, 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 long time. There are many things which have, you have to rely on NMR only, especially the dynamics part. Even the folded proteins, many folded, but if you look at the total uh, PDB structures in the um, data banks, a large number of well-folded structures have certain areas which are uh, unfolded, they are disordered. And these areas, you generally can't see them in the crystallography. In the PDB files, you will see them missing. And many of the complexes which have been determined using the protein-protein complexes, the loop areas are missing. You cannot see them. And if it so happens that the many of the loop areas are responsible for the function. I give an example of the Canada core in uh, chromatin. I, I look at these things in, uh, in Ashutosh lab, which they are looking at complexes of different proteins. And may, there are many, at least a dozen proteins, complexes have been determined. In every one of them, they are with the different F-box proteins and the loop areas are missing in every one of those. And that is the only thing which is responsible for allowing for the proteins to recognize particular binding partners. And that you can see only in NMR. So many of the folded proteins, even though large and small, they will have loop areas, the disordered regions. These are becoming more and more important in recognition phenomena, and that can only be looked at by NMR. Of course, you can use other techniques, no, never undermine the importance of the other techniques. You have to use other techniques to get major portions of the structural information, which you cannot access by uh, NMR spectroscopy. But then of course, the importance where it lies, will have to be ex probably exploited. So therefore, as I said, developments will happen with regard to sensitivity enhancements. Various kinds of techniques are being used. In fact, sometimes I asked a question when one of the lectures, I said, uh, is there a possibility that you look at NMR of a single molecule? Because this is a tremendous challenge. One of the lectures. Yeah, you heard that lecture. In one of the lectures, I said, okay, is it possible to determine the NMR spectrum of a single molecule? This is an enormous challenge because the developments will have to happen. If anybody sort of predicts that uh, the NMR has ended, actually Richard Duns himself said at some time that don't make that prediction. It's going to be very dangerous. So never say anything of that sort. So it will continue to grow, continue to grow. And the, currently the dynamics part, which is there, which is not accessible to many of the techniques in a global manner, in the sense that all regions of the proteins, the residuous detail, which you can get, you can get certain local information by certain techniques, which are also very, very valuable. So you'll have to combine all the techniques. Ultimately, it is the science that matters. You use different techniques to combine and get the information that is required for understanding the system as a whole and produce good quality science. I think that is, uh, that is an overall uh, analysis of the contributions of the different techniques and where NMR is going to stay. Yeah. This, answer, this is with regard to Sudipto, what you yeah. said very, very yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Russell, for your Thank you very discussion. Much. Yeah, discussion. And I think Neil and you have, uh, you know, put that context very clear for the audience. Um, any other questions, comments, Shamlauda? Uh, maybe I think, uh, yeah, definitely Neil has given a very nice overview of the contribution of Professor Ernst and 
in the perspective of nmr development of the nmr techniques i was just thinking that you know two aspects one of them is uh, of course uh, use of nmr in uh, uh, the study of dynamics and another one is uh, metabolics and that is something which uh, uh, of course uh, for metabolics mass spectrometry possibly is now you know going ahead but still you know there are certain uh, you know aspects of that where uh, nmr is still uh, the preferred technique so that is something which needs to be uh, maybe you can comment on that samla you are absolutely right I means uh, this has two areas and but one place i did disagree that uh, mass spectrometry has taken a lead for metabolomics what has recently there is a paper in a, uh, this uh, journal uh, acs publication that mass spectrometry actually overestimated the metabolites and this is happening because of the sample manipulations and that's why in many of the clinical setting uh, hospitals the non cryo probe standard 600 megahertz spectrometer is being used because you don't touch do any manipulation to the samples yeah and there, there are there are balancing you know, factors at there of course yeah for clinical nmr is still there yes please for for proteo- for other things for proteomics and everything mass is absolutely unparalleled and nothing yeah. nothing comes into the even for volatile thing gcms is the best volatile mass if you have to take breath or something gcms is the best yeah i, yeah, I agree with that yeah. and for bus for the urine metabolites because urine is the best source for metabolites considering urine has a less enzymatic activity so in that case urine is directly taken and in nmr tube and put it and it gets some mm, yeah. efficient good data so there it's uh, it's still finding and that's why in clinical setting it is still hospitals are taking especially those which are very high concentration for them nmr i think is like you know glucose and other things and very easily detected by and what i other the other mass spec has difficulty in detecting yeah what i heard now means uh, in italy people are trying to develop a dnp coupled 600 megahertz nmr so that even a nanomolar uh, metabolites can be easily picked up by nmr it's, it's just purely for the clinical setting they are developing nothing for nothing else sorry okay okay um i i just wanted to uh, just uh, put something neel that in your in your slide with nmr evolution and you put uh, block and parcel and then urns and uh, don't don't you feel that we should put dharmati's name too in in the development of the chemical the access the chemical shift i think i think this enormous contribution by a chemist amongst a physicist community change the way where we actually think about the x axis no absolutely that's man i will i i must correct this thing you have I mean, initially i had a very t- I mean, this slide i made sometime back right. for city <laughs> and it was very difficult to find professor dharmati's photo photo and, yes yes and i checked in tfr i asked many people archive has it archive has it TFR. apparently 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 that was the only one photo which i could get you know we had some photograph we presented uh, we showed them in uh, sabik in 2017 in okay okay we no, have that I, but yeah, yeah, uh, can i add can i add there jyotishman in this the story of dharmati yes yes please you know dharmati this is a very interesting story yes so when he was in felix block at that time as neil also mentioned the emphasis was on measuring the magnetic moments correct right. so magnetic moments measurement means proton has a constant magnetic moment why should uh-huh. different protons have different magnetic moments uh-huh. why should it should be one signal only yeah so the felix block asked dharmati to measure the magnetic moment of water proton in water yeah but dharmati put alcohol for what reason one doesn't know he put alcohol and then he got three signals felix block would not believe it he said yeah. you must have made some mistake this is not correct it cannot happen like this so much so that he actually did not become an author on that paper they published that paper adharmati pound and um, uh, the um, uh, pakar so they published that paper dharmat felix block did not put his name on the paper he did not agree right so and so but then of course afterwards many when many people recognized that okay this is indeed a real fact and then of course nothing stopping from there and bhama picked him up Yeah. when felix block and bhava right. were good friends right felix block and bhava were good friends when bhava went to felix block he said yes i want i'm looking for a person in this and he said okay dharmati is there he just brought him here 
Right. He says at that time TFR was an institution of physics only. There is yes. nothing. There was only a cosmic rays and astronomy, astrophysics. That right. was all it was there. Right. People wondered why he got Dharmati here was a pure chemist. Right. Of course, similar thing happened with biology as well. Homi Baba got to obey Siddiqui. Everybody right. questioned why you are getting a biologist in a physics institution. Right. Then he actually said at that time that look, after 20 years, you'll all be doing biology. <laughs> so, <laughs> so therefore, I think the barriers, he recognized that there were no barriers. Yeah. All of them will add to each other and you have to recognize the strength of each of them. And Dharmati contributed a lot. Unfortunately, he passed away of heart attack. This yeah. is, uh, that is very sad. Yeah. What I, what I heard from Anil Kumar that Felix Block told Dharmati that these three peaks are coming because of alcohol in a sample or alcohol in your brain. Alcohol in the brain. Because you used to drink, that's what it is. Of course, of course, you were looking at, the, at that time, you were looking at the oscilloscope only. There were no recording. You were just yes, looking yes. the signals on the oscilloscope. Yeah, so it only because he was drunk, that's why he got three peaks or something. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, that's a very nice story and anecdote. I think this uh, YouTube video is there, will be there in TFR YouTube channel so people can revisit this story as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Hosur. I wanted to bring that up simply because. Uh, the new students Thank and all the, the who are joined TF are, I just wanted to tell about DCS and the history. So Dharmati's position in actually starting the chemical physics program in TFR is enormous and his contribution to NMR X axis is enormous. So, <laughs> so without that, I think yes. uh, we, yes. will, we will not have the entire, you know, the name chemical shift is because of a chemist. So this is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Very correctly put. Yeah, way. yeah. So, so okay. Um, any other questions or comments from the audience here? Kaloda is here still. Kaloda, is there anything you want to say? Arad? No, no, no. It's a fantastic talk. I'm just enjoying all the discussions. Okay, well. okay. So, <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Kaloda. Thank you. So, um, Neil, we have set up a few meetings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll first applaud. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, uh, okay. I, mean, I, will, I, will, I will leave now. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, Professor Hosur, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Thank yeah. You. Okay. So, so, so uh, Neil, we have some meetings. I think yeah. uh, uh, if you can um, take a break and then join at 5.30. Is yeah, that possible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. this possible. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so 5.30, I think I have sent you the schedule. So, yeah, yeah, I have the schedule. I have, I have the schedule. So I think I'll, 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 I'll just remain logged in. I'll just uh, switch off my video and audio and come back. Sure. Shamalavada is first, then Koti, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah. Yeah. And then Professor okay. Madhu. Yeah. Okay. Neil. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I, I miss West Canton coffee now. Haha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. promise, I promise I will take you if you come once here. So, yeah. Not yeah. just coffee yeah. for the lunch. Yeah, no, also the lunch. Yeah, also the lunch. lunch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, Neil, okay. I'm going to host a host, okay? Neil. Okay, I'll come back to you in 5 minutes. Yeah, I'll be there. So, yeah. anyway. Uh... Yes, I'll be there in 5 minutes. Okay. Shamlavada, I'm going to start the chat. ठीक आचे ठीक आचे ठीक आचे ठीक आचे